I'm going to read one verse of Scripture out of Psalm chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> I'm so glad to have Joan with me. She doesn't travel with me much. When we were young, I dragged her around all over the place. And, and uh, when I started this last tenure of evangelism four years ago, she said, you go wherever God wants you to go and I will pray for you and when you get back I'm going to be sitting in this recliner right here and me and Reagan, Reagan is my youngest son he's seven he's a black and white Havanese puppy and so her and Reagan do well, she doesn't travel with me much but she wanted to come to La Roger Psalm 12 1 Help, Lord. Oh, anybody ever said that? Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fall from among the children of men. And I, I'm going to speak about falling out of failure. that subject before falling out of failure the scripture in Psalms tell us that the godly and the faithful sometimes fail uh, I received the Holy Ghost when I was eight years old 54 years ago so I I've had a lot more time living with the Holy Ghost than I did without it, which means I have done a lot more failing since God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Everyone fails. But it is always imperative that we understand the difference between failing and being a failure. Uh, You didn't fail because you were ungodly or unfaithful. Maybe you feel like that you have failed at times as a family member, as an employee, as a student, as a friend, as a Christian. Aren't you glad that built into your spiritual opportunities is the privilege of repenting not not just that first time before God filled you with the Holy Ghost but aren't you glad that you can go to the Lord every morning in a with a repentant heart and he doesn't say oh it's her again every day you know every day he comes and he's he's repenting and he's asking for forgiveness when is this guy going to get his act together and my answer to that is probably just about the time the trump of God sounds and you resurrect me out of this world because I was made from dust. And uh, no, no one is a failure all the time, but the realization of our failure can grab us and make us feel a deep sense of failure. I hope I'm not depressing you today. You know, I may, perhaps I should be bragging on us. I'd be glad to brag on you, but I don't do good bragging on me because I, I know me. The only person who knows me better than me is God and Joan. And but actually. Uh, in the 34 years that God allowed me to be a pastor, I tried to help many people through this fog of failure. And sometimes it could be a small thing. Maybe your, perhaps your children have all just lived great lives and had no problems and just lived for God. 
did not cause you any problems. You know, and if you fit that, then God bless you. And then that's, that's something you should repent of probably. Uh, there have been times that I looked at my two boys and I thought, you know, a, a, a ball peen hammer or a pine knot right now would be great discipline. <laughs> but they survived me and I survived them. I want to make some key statements about failure. Number one, failure does not mean you are disgraced. You tried. You tried. Failing does not mean you're a failure because it just means you have not yet been successful. Failing does not mean you've accomplished nothing. You've learned something. Maybe learned what didn't work. Failing does not mean you don't have it. Maybe you should just do it a different way. Failing does not mean you should give up. It means maybe perhaps you should try harder. Failing does not mean you're inferior. It just means that you're not yet perfect does not mean you've wasted your life. Failing means you have a chance to start again. And you can start again. I love what Jeremiah said in Lamentations chapter 3. His mercies are new every morning. And I need them every morning. I'm glad I can wake up and I, I start my prayer time before I get out of bed. Uh, I'm thankful that I wake up in my home or in a hotel room or wherever and not in a hospital. I have awakened in a hospital before. I, I'd rather wake up. I thank God for a good night's rest. Well, every, Brother Mahoney, every night I don't get a good night's rest. My mama taught me if you don't wake up in a foxhole or a funeral home, you've had a good night's rest. So... You can start again. Every day gives you the chance to start again. But you have to remember something. The new day does not begin at dawn. The new day begins at midnight, which is the darkest time, the farthest from daylight. So what if you feel like that you're in a dark place. That doesn't mean it's not a new day. The new day begins at midnight. Failing is not falling down. Being a failure is staying down. That is what uh, needs to be considered. I, I love this scripture out of Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. You know, if, you're, if you don't stay down, you're not a failure. If you climb back up, you're not a failure. When you try, you may try some new things in the Spirit, make some fresh commitments in the Holy Ghost, want God to do something different in your life, and it doesn't pan out. If you get up, you haven't failed. Now, I, I grew up around uh, the gifts of the Spirit in operation in my parents all of my life. It was just common tongues, interpretation, prophecy. Uh, my dad was a pastor, and I, it was very, very common. I had never given a message in tongues. So my wife and I married. I, I was a 
confirmed bachelor until I was 17 years old. And uh, wow is right. <laughs> and uh, we married and three weeks later moved to Texas Bible College in Houston. And so this was my freshman year of Bible school. And I, I wanted to be used of God to give a message in tongues. You know, I'd been around it. I wasn't scared of it, but I hadn't done it. So I remember uh, this particular night we were uh, we went to a different church every three months as part of our training program. And I just felt such an unction from God, and I stood up and just hammered it out, man. It sounded bold. It sounded very authoritative and prophetic. And I said, God is using me to give a message in tongues. And then I sat down and waited for the interpretation and, and I'm still waiting nobody interpreted it and I, my first thought was oh my god you idiot that wasn't God you were showing off you just wanted to do something what do you mean why didn't you stay down why didn't you just shut up you know, you know the Bible I think could be helped sometimes if just maybe every fourth page it would just have in red letters just shut up <laughs> and it says that but not like that so so I, I sat down and I felt so in, and then my second emotion was I got sanctimonious because I thought I guess I'm the only spiritual person in this place. <laughs> Nobody else. And I thought to myself, well, that's that. I tried that. That didn't work. That's over with. Well, I'm glad that that was a, I don't know, I don't think that was a failure. I, I don't know what it was. You don't have to explain everything. I'm glad I don't have to explain everything. <laughs> but thankfully, God has used me in that often. Uh, God takes pleasure in lifting the fallen. He doesn't shoot his wounded. And uh, there's a little passage in 2 Samuel 14, verse 14. In that verse it says, Yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. He arranges things so that people who have fallen are not expelled from him. They still have a place. You know, our, our old nature raises its head in condemnation. I'm so glad Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Your old nature does not want you to have a second chance. Your old taskmaster wants you back. I don't know you. I don't know what is in your rear view mirror. But there, you will always notice that your windshield is a lot larger than your rear view mirror. That means God wants you looking forward more than he wants you looking back. Praise God. Praise God. He's made a way for us to start over. I'm talking about falling out of failure. What happens when we fail is not nearly as important as what happens after we fail. Some people refuse to try again. They blame others. They can't, you know, Cancel your plans for success. Many fail backward. I want to help you fail forward. I pastored a precious lady for a number of years, and uh, I only knew her as a precious, praying, worshiping, faithful, consistent child of God. But her family told me that 
uh, earlier years past in her Christian experience. She was in and out. She would come in, do well for a while, and then the tug of the world would pull at her, and she would drift away and back and forth and back and forth. And uh, I, I couldn't see that in her, but they told me that. And then she'd come back in, and God was gracious again, renewed her in the Holy Ghost, and boom, it stuck. I only knew her as a model Christian. When I preached her funeral, I, I uh, told her family, well, as, as she was dying in the hospital, all of her kids were there, and I pulled all of them around her, and I said, Now, if you ever want to see her again, you need to do what she's done, what she's doing today. If you ever, if you ever want to see her again, don't, don't wait till we're standing at a coffin in a few hours and make promises to her. You, you, and they all walked up to her and they, they told her, I don't know if, how conscious she was, but they promised her that they would live for God. And as far as I know, only one of them is as of this moment. But I told them I, at the funeral, I said, you promised your mama what you was going to do. You wanted to be like her so you could see her again. And they had seen her in her ups and downs. They had had years to watch her serve God fearlessly. After you fail, you know, some people refuse to try again. They blame others and cancel your plans uh, for anything successful. You know, I hate to see people give up. I hate to see people blaming somebody else for your problem, you know. Uh, I told you, I believe last year or the last time I was here, somebody's always blaming their past. You know, my, my daddy whipped me with a belt. Well, my daddy whipped me with a belt. You know, his daddy whipped him with a razor strap. My grandma whipped my mama with a butcher knife. You know, you say, my God, that's abuse. Well, knowing my mama like I did, probably needed it. She sure didn't jump around while she was whipping her. <laughs> that's right. But you know what? I know it's a different day. I understand some of this stuff I wouldn't say if young people were in here. But some, there, some people's always blaming on the fact that, well, I, I came from a dysfunctional family. I'm going to tell you something. If, uh, if you have one man and one woman living in the same house with one thermostat, you have a dysfunctional family. That's right. Deal with it. Okay. Deal with it. Hallelujah. Good people who make bad mistakes do not automatically become bad people. Put your faith in Jesus. Remember, Micah said, when I fall, I shall arise. By his grace, I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to die bitter. I choose that. If, if you become bitter, you have to choose that. You can't blame a situation or a circumstance I, uh, I recently, my wife and I were driving down the road on the interstate. We passed through a sign I could have exited to go to a particular place where I lived as a young man. And I told my wife, that's the place where I came the closest in my life to hating somebody. I hate to say that. I hate to admit that. I was just a young teenager. That's the closest I ever came 
to Haiti. An individual. I don't, I didn't, don't, don't, don't blame it on somebody. I want to help you fail forward. It means I'll accept the blame and it's not the school's fault or the parents' fault or the pastor's fault or the church's fault. It's, you know, it's not that. It's all right. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Uh, we all make bad choices. How do you get to the place where you can make good choices? by making a bunch of bad choices and learning from it. Don't you wish you could bottle this up and feed it intravenously to your children and grandchildren, you know? You know why your children and grandchildren make bad choices sometimes? They learned it from us. That's right. We look back, look at them and give them all sorts of wisdom because we got knots on our head from some of our bad choices but I'll, I'll be up again I'll be up again Romans 14 and 12 says so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God that means I can't blame it on anybody else can't blame anybody Failing forward means I will accept the blame. You fail forward when you learn from your failure. You, you learn Isaiah 3 and 10 says that we will eat the fruit of our own doings when we learn. Some folks just don't learn. They just keep on, keep on. As a pastor, I was never a good counselor. I uh, should have been better. You know, I really should have. I, I started pastoring when I was very young, 23 years old, and I should have had more wisdom. But for people that had been living for God for years and then act childish and, and do dumb stuff, I guess I had done so much dumb stuff myself I was kind of frustrated and I would I often would want to say you know uh, and I, I would tell couples that I would counsel that don't don't do this uh, I would trying to help them help their marriage and I I would say when they came to me I said have you done what I asked you to do the last time we talked and if they said, well, no, I said, well, there's, we have nothing to talk about right now. And uh, I always want to blame somebody. <laughs> I get the marriage counseling can be the funniest thing in the world. I had a couple walk into my office one time. And they'd been there before. And that was not the last time they I know what it's like to sit on the couch between them and hold it, hold them by the hand and just shut my eyes and pray until <laughs> things got better. And they walked in. They made an appointment to come see me. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say stuff like this. Uh, and when they walked into the office, there was a very dark cloud hanging over them. It was a thunderstorm. It was about to bur burst through. And they sat down in front of me and uh, crossed the desk and just looked at me. And I'm just, and then I finally I say, you know, is there a purpose to this meeting? What, what, what's, what's all about here? And she scooted forward on her chair. And she said, Brother Mahoney, he never says, I'm sorry, first. Do not do what I did. I, I said, you know what we need to do? We need to take him out behind the church and just 
give him a good beating because that's the most awful thing I've ever heard any, about any man in my whole life. He never says, I'm sorry first. Well, I don't think she meant he had never in his life said it, but apparently in their most recent disagreement, he didn't apologize first, and she, she wanted to blame him for it. I think I'm being too honest, and my wife is here, and she, she doesn't like for me to get too honest, you know? But she doesn't travel with me much, and I've gotten used to just preaching what I wanted to preach. <clears throat> you got to accept responsibility. Don't be afraid to do that. The most macho thing that a man can do is humble himself in the sight of God. You fail forward when you get up and try again. You look at the people that Jesus called to be his disciples. Woo, what a motley crew. And the biggest risk that Jesus ever took is when he looked at a man named Simon and he said, Thou art Simon, but thou shalt be called Cephas or Peter, which is a stone. Oh, Jesus, this guy will be a thorn in your side. He's got a big mouth. He'll talk when he should be quiet. When he should speak up, he'll run. He'll become tongue-tied in the presence of a little girl who accuses him. And he, he wants to fight when it's time to pray. And he just... You're, you're running a big risk with Peter. You, you, need to, you need to not plan much for Peter. But you know what? Peter always came back. Oh, he denied him. He cut off a servant's ear. And Jesus reached down and picked up the ear and put it back on Malchus' head. It, it seems like Jesus was always cleaning up after Simon Peter. Because, you know finally had to tell him one time get behind me Satan thou savorest not the things of God and... but you know what Peter kept coming back he kept coming back and you know what he had Jesus gave him the keys man I, I don't know if I'd have done that he trusted him with the keys you know why? Because he knew he would keep coming back. If he erred, he would still humble himself down. I want to help you fall out of failure. You got a choice. You can fall backward or you can fall forward. I remember one time I made a decision that I thought was God. I still don't know be honest I still don't know I think about it it looks like it was just indigestion but I really felt like it was God I made public statements about it being God and then it within 90 days it it had soured and oh and I felt like just awful just awful I just was embarrassed and uh, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, anyway, it was, I just uh, I made a move. I resigned a good church, and I went in a direction that I thought was God. And I was just embarrassed by the whole situation. And you know what? People began to come up to me and tell me about things that they had experienced in their life. I didn't know anything about it. Some of the finest preachers in our movement would pull me aside and say, you know what happened to me, Brother Mahoney? You know what I did? <laughs> and I, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm not a rare breed. In every one of our rearview mirrors, there are things that we would like to go back and clean up. 
And you know what? We can. You know how? We can repent, fall forward, and Jesus puts that in a place where he himself cannot find it. That's what he said. I will cast them into a, the depths of the sea, never to be remembered. When God forgives, it is as if it never happened. And ten years later, when you bring it back up because something has reminded you of it, God looks at you and says, you know, I just don't know what you're talking about. Because when he puts it behind his blood, it is so secure that he himself cannot find it. Oh, that's good news. That is good news. Jeremiah 18 talks about a potter and the clay being marred. But God didn't, he said the potter didn't throw it away. He made it another vessel. He made it another vessel. There was a violin maker, the world's most renowned violin maker, and a maestro came to him and he told him I want you to make me the perfect violin if it's not perfect I'll, I'll pick it up this man spent many months fashioning this violin with his own hands and uh, finally he contacted this virtuoso violinist and he came he handed him the violin and the man began to play. And after a few moments, he grabbed the violin by the neck and slammed it against a table. And it broke into hundreds of pieces. He said, I said I want the perfect violin. And he walked out now, this violin maker was in awe of this man, but his heart was crushed. It took a couple of years, but he called the violinist back again. He said, would you come try? I've made another violin. And he came to his workplace. He handed him the violin, and he picked it up. And he began to play. And his eyes closed. And the, the maker could tell that the violinist was enraptured with that instrument. And he played and he played. Finally, he put it down and he said, You have fashioned the perfect violin. How did you do it? He said, Well, this is the same violin that you broke. But I took the pieces and I put them back together. And in fashioning that new violin out of the broken pieces, there was some character built into it. That sounds familiar to me. Ye which were sometimes afar off are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are justified, but ye are sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world recognizes the difference between failing and being a failure. Do you know how many Cokes, the Coca-Cola bottling company, sold the, their first year in business? Any idea? 400 their first year in operation Coca-Cola sold 400 bottles of Coke <laughs> the first Dr. Seuss book was rejected by 23 publishers before one agreed to print it 
you think about Babe Ruth, you think about home runs. But when you think about Babe Ruth, you also need to think about strikeouts. When he retired, he was the home run leader and the strikeout leader. So, I used to follow baseball very closely as a kid. I was a Los Angeles Dodgers fan. Sandy Koufax was my hero. I know stuff about Sandy Koufax I should not know. I should not remember, you know. I sometimes can't find my socks. But I could tell you that on September the 9th, 1965, Sandy Koufax pitched a perfect game against the Chicago Cubs, and he won one to nothing. His re regular catcher was out sick, and Joey Amalfitano was the catcher. Now, that has blessed you, hasn't it? <laughs> that has made your whole day. Why can you remember stuff like that? And then, uh, you know. But I want to tell you something. History's boldest accomplishments often followed its most staggering failures. And living for God's that way. It's not just making a start. We got the book of Acts to tell us how to see the kingdom and enter the kingdom and be a part of the kingdom. And then we've got a bunch of epistles that teach us how to deal with failures in our life and being remade every day and working to become more like him. Mark Carruthers wrote a beautiful song. It says, down on the bottom, all friends are gone. Down on the bottom, I can't go on. Enemy surrounding me, laughing at my calamity, telling me that there's no way to reach up to the light of day. But I'll be up again. Just you wait and see. Rough times won't get me down. They'll just send me to my knees. And there while I'm in prayer, God will give a victory song. I'll be up again where I belong. <laughs> Would you stand with me right now? Rejoice not against me, O oh, mine enemy, when I fall. I shall arise, I shall arise. Aren't you glad that you don't have to be perfect for Jesus to fall in love with you? He promises us that he will nurture us and care for us and help us. He remembereth that we are but flesh. He acknowledges that we are but dust. And uh, perhaps there are areas that all of us need help in you ever feel like that you have arrived you've pulled up in the wrong driveway that's right it doesn't take long for God to allow things in your life that and it's important for you to let the circumstances of life push you into a corner where you have to pray yourself out of it it's very it, it's needful for you I had a friend years ago found a little bird's egg. He could tell that the little bird had started to chip through the shell. And uh, he thought, well, I'm going to help this little bird so he doesn't have to work to free himself from this shell. What he didn't realize is that that bird's feathers is attached to that shell. And the process of him 
pecking through day by day builds strength into his body and that effort enables him to eventually break out and be free but in his trying to help remove the shell he actually pulled the little bird apart so you say well God get me out of this well he he will he will sometimes he will remove it and sometimes he will say come on just just keep pegging keep pushing keep believing keep praying stand tall look the devil right in the eye and say when I fall I shall arise can we worship the Lord together